Right, so as you guys know, I'm a huge fan of multiple streams of income. Especially in this last year, a lot of people have noticed that if you're reliant on your job as your only source of income, and you lose that job for whatever reason, a global pandemic or anything else, then that's quite an unsafe and unsatisfying position to be in overall. And so the idea of building multiple income streams is that if you lose any of them, then you've still got other ways of adding money to your life and we need money to survive. And even if you've got a job that's pretty safe, like being a doctor, for example, then having multiple streams of income gives you the freedom and flexibility to do things like go part-time if that's what you wanna do. But chances are you already knew that and you might've seen mine and other people's videos around our current streams of passive income. The problem with those is that when, when someone quite ahead of you in the journey, it can be very hard to relate to it. And so in this video, I wanna take you back to my school and university years where I first started building up my streams of income from zero. And I'm gonna show you the nine different streams of income I had by the age of 23 in three different categories. Let's get into it. Now, there's nothing wrong with trading time for money. It's how a lot of jobs work. You put in the hours and you get paid as a result of it. And when I was growing up, I had four different ways that I was trading my own time for money. I was providing services and getting paid for them. The first one I started to do around the age of 13 and that was freelance web development. So I learned how to code by following free tutorials on the internet. At the time, there was a website called W3Schools. Nowadays, there are dozens, hundreds of other sources, better sources to learn how to code for free on the internet. But then once I was reasonably okay at coding within a few months of dabbling with my own personal projects, I started doing freelance web development on a website called getacoder.com. These days, Fiverr and Upwork and People Per Hour are the sort of freelance marketplaces where if you're good at something, you can advertise your services and then people will hire you to do the thing. And so while I was in school between the ages of 13 and 17, I did a handful of these coding projects. Some of them were quite long and took absolutely ages. And you know, my hourly rate was so was probably really, really, really low. But I think in that period, I made about a thousand dollars in total which at the time was quite a lot of money for me because I was a kid, I didn't have any other streams of income. So I was like, oh my God, I am making money by designing websites with people on the internet. Then we move on to stream number two of income. And that was when I was 14, I got a job as a part-time tutor at this uh, maths and English study center called Kumon. I was pretty good at maths, not gonna lie, hashtag flex. And so I asked the instructor, her name was Alison. I was like, hey, Alison, I'm 14 now, so I'm legally allowed to work part-time. Can I get a job as like a, you know, a helper at the study center? And so I got a job where my salary was initially four pounds per hour. And then after two years, I got a pay raise to five pounds an hour. And then when I was like 18, I got a pay raise to six pounds an hour. So every week for between two and four hours, I'd be doing this thing. And again, that was a lot of money for me because I would be getting like between 20 and 30 pounds a week. And I was like, oh my God, I'm rich. I'm making so much money. This is so good. And that was my first real experience of like actually having a job where I had to turn up and actually had to have proper hours. And it was one of those things like, it was quite fun when stuff was going on. Like I really enjoyed teaching people when they came to me for maths help, but I didn't enjoy marking work and doing the grunt work that came with a job. And at the time I kind of realized that, hmm, this is the problem with a job, right? Like some bits of it are gonna be fun, but the other bits of it are gonna be boring. And often it was just the banter I had with the other tutors who were there that made the job much more fun. Um, but that was stream number two of income. And so with these two examples, like there's nothing particularly fancy about these streams of income. I had a skill which I learned on the internet or I just had innately thanks to schooling and stuff, i.e. coding and maths. And I sought out jobs where people were literally paying me to do that service for them. This is just how the world of jobs works. And I get so many messages from people being like, hey, how do I build passive income? And it's like, you know, it, it, it's quite hard to build streams of income that are completely passive. And if you don't ha currently have streams of income, starting out with active income, i.e. trading your time for money, is a very reasonable starting point because it makes you build up the skills and it helps you appreciate what it's actually like to work for a paycheck um, outside of your kind of standard job. And that brings us on to stream number three, which was close up magic. So when I was 17, I decided I wanted to be a magician for various reasons. And then when I got to university in my first three or four years, I was performing close up magic and getting paid for it to do it at balls and parties and dinners and stuff. And that was kind of cool because I was being paid sometimes between 50 and 150 pounds per hour to like go around tables and go around people at a ball and like be like, hey guys, do you wanna see a magic trick? And again, in the grand scheme of things, this wasn't a lot of money, but it was a decent amount of pocket money back in the day where when it would get to the ball season, I'd be like, oh, I've got a few hundred pounds in the bank that I didn't have before this. And again, it's the sort of thing that literally anyone can learn. Like there was nothing special about me. I just found free tutorials on YouTube and you know, random PDFs on the internet. I learned how to do like a few tricks 
And if you're a professional magician, you actually don't need to learn, learn that many tricks. All you need is like nine things, like three sets of three, and you just walk around doing them and you can get paid for it. And there were a lot of people I knew at, at university who were also vaguely into magic and knew the same tricks as I did. They just didn't take that extra step to start putting themselves out there and start trying to make money from the craft. And this is just a general attitude I have towards life that if you enjoy something, for me at least, if I enjoy something, then I will often try and find a way to make money from it. Because when you find a way to monetize your hobbies, then it's kind of cool because you're doing the hobby, which is fun. And then you're making money from it, which is also fun. But you're doing the hobby in a way that adds market value, i.e. that it's useful to other people. Like with magicians, a, bit, a big problem that magicians have is that like if you're learning magic, it's very easy to just sit in front of your camera or your webcam and just do some card tricks and learn these moves and stuff. But it's really when you go out into the real world and actually affect people that you can start making money from the thing. So I think becoming a sort of semi-professional, <laughs> sort of paid amateur close-up magician really taught me the idea that if you want to make money, you do have to add value to other people. No one actually cares about my magic. What they cared about was the experience I was giving them. And I've taken that and applied it to all the other streams of income as well. And there's a great book I'm reading at the moment called The Millionaire Fast Lane, where he says, uh, to make millions, you have to impact millions. It's called, he calls it the law of affection. And I think that's like a pretty nice way of doing it. To make money, you just have to impact people, whether it's doing trivial card tricks or doing something a little bit more meaningful than that. No offense to any magicians out there. Chapter two, productized services. Now the problem with trading time for money is that it's not particularly scalable. And if you're working on an hourly basis, you're valuing your time on an hourly basis. And if you can get into the point where you're productizing your services, i.e. you're doing a service, but instead of charging per hour, you're packaging it up and turning it into a little package that you can then sell to people, then it becomes a lot easier to make more money from basically doing the same stuff. And there's an amazing book by my friend Robin Waite called Take Your Shot which is literally all about this thing of like how to go from being someone who earns per hour to becoming the sort of person who earns large amounts of money for productized services. And there were three main ways that I did this when I was at university. So between the ages of about 19 and 23, the first one was app design. I had a bit of a web design portfolio at this point, And I was, you know, often meeting people who were creating medical technology startups. And they would see that my design skills were legit because I was going to hackathons and like showing my services and that kind of stuff and they'd hire me to do kind of app design for them. And some of these people I worked for hourly on an hourly rate, but I tried my best to turn it into a package where instead of me saying that, hey, you know, I'll do this for a certain number of hours and you'll pay me this amount per hour. Instead, I was saying, hey, I will design the first draft of your app and I will give you all the files and you can have two revisions and I will charge you 800 pounds for that. And I was quite surprised when people said yes to that because that wasn't gonna take me very long but I could charge a premium for that. Equally, if someone said they wanted a website built, I would be like, I'd give them a quote for the whole website design package rather than a, hey, this is actually only gonna take me about half an hour to set up a WordPress theme. Therefore, I'm gonna charge you from a half an hour of my time. Instead, I was thinking about like the value that I'm giving to them, packaging it up and charging for the whole package rather than per hour. So that was number four. Stream number five that again used this concept of productized services was a course that I set up when I was 19 years old called the BMAT Crash Course. Now the BMAT is an exam that some medical schools in the UK require if you wanna to apply to medical school. And before I packaged it up as the BMAT Crash Course, I was helping people with BMAT like tutoring one-on-one -on -one for like 20 pounds an hour. But then in the summer of my first year of med school, I had the idea that, hey, why don't I turn this into a product? Why don't I turn it into a productized service? And I packaged up everything I knew about how to teach the BMAT into a one day course, which we called the BMAT crash course. And I think in our first year, we were charging 69 pounds for the whole day course, which was like really cheap as an hourly rate. But it meant that I could get 30 people in a classroom because they were signing up for this product. They were signing up for this course. And it was a thing rather than me just being a private tutor trading my time for money. And the nice thing about productized services is that they do let you scale. Uh, often if you're charging per hour, you can't have 30 people in a class. But if you're charging for a course, you can suddenly have 30 people in a class. And so we were making like 2,000 pounds for a day of work for teaching people. And the teaching was quite fun and we got really good reviews and we're making really good money. And so the BMAT crash course became this thing that me and my friends would run every year. And it was quite nice because it ended up being a huge like injection of funds into my life when I was at university. And then stream number six of income, again, based on productized services is a company called SixMed that I founded while I was at university that's still going to this day. And SixMed was basically a combination of the BMAT crash course, the UK cap crash course and our interview crash course, along with like help for personal statements. And 
basically everything we could do to help people get into med school. But again, we were never charging by the hour. We were never saying, hey, we're gonna charge you X amount per hour to do private tutoring. Instead, it was all based on creating products, these different courses, that multiple people could sign up for, and that let us do this productized service thing at scale. And so while I was at university, every year I was making around about 40,000 pounds, which is about $50,000, which is more than I was making when I'm in my first two years of actually being a doctor. And I was making that money through med school on the side while teaching these courses on weekends. And it was pretty sick. And it was all based around the principle of productized services. Chapter number three, digital products. So at this point, I'm like 21 years old. I've got these productized services that are making decent amounts of money. But the problem with all this kind of stuff, as I recognize, and you know, at this point I had these like five streams of income. The problem was that a lot of it was tied to my time and it was a lot of effort. Like I was going through med school at Cambridge University. It's supposed to be quite hard. It was, it was quite hard in fairness. And on the weekends, I'd be being, be basically staying up, being like, oh my God, our, our course manuals, you know, we had these physical books that we would get delivered to the different venues all around the country. Have they been delivered on time? Have Jake and Catherine made it to Manchester safely? And have they checked into their hotel so they can check book, book things the next day? Has all of our conference room bookings gone? And there was a lot of logistical headache around running these physical courses. And so while I was doing that, I knew that the next step up would be digital products. Because the great thing about digital products is that you make it once and then you can sell it a zillion times and it doesn't take any more effort to sell a million copies of a digital product as it does to sell one copy of a digital product. And so automatically you have this idea of scale built into it. And so stream number seven of income was when I decided that, hey, hang on, we had more students than we could handle wanting to sign up for our courses. And we also had students from all around the world. Like there were some people in Australia and Singapore who knew people in the UK who'd gone to our courses who said they were very good. And they were like, can we have access to your course materials? And so I thought, hang on, this is interesting. And so what I did was that I turned our course manual that I wrote a few years ago for the course itself. I just turned it into an ebook. I just sold it on the website for like, I think 29 pounds or something like that. And people would buy it and I'd send them the PDF. And that was that. And that was a way of like, selling a digital product that didn't take any effort other than me manually emailing it to them. And I was just making money and it, and it really felt like free money at this point. The courses never felt like free money because it was a lot of work to run them. But selling digital products on the internet to people all around the world who'd never met me, that really was like free money. And then we have the culmination of digital products, which was stream number eight and nine. And that was when I was 21, my brother and I decided that we needed to make an online question bank for medical applicants for the BMAT and for the UK CAT. These are two different medical school entrance exams. And we called them BMAT Ninja and UK CAT Ninja because the dot ninja domain name I, I, I had for a while. I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. And, and so I coded the back end design. He coded the front end design of these two websites. And the way it was, it was like, it was a bank of questions and students could sign up and they could subscribe to the question bank for like 29 pounds or whatever. And then they'd have access to all the questions and all of the answers and all that kind of stuff. And then as they'd be doing the questions, it would, it would sort of track their progress and it would give them like an experience bar to fill out. And so this was like the dream digital product. This is called in, in the business SaaS, S-A-A-S, software as a service. We were basically selling software. We were selling access to this bank of questions and the software that we had put together from scratch to create this bank of questions. And again, this is the sort of thing that really felt like free money. Like it was so much work putting these question banks together. Like we, I think we did it over the summer of 2015 for the BMAT Ninja. And it was, it was loads of work. We were basically working all day, every day for many months to actually put this together. But A, it was really fun because coding and stuff is cool and me and my brother both enjoy it. And we were like hanging out and working together and we'd be sitting on the dining table together. Or I'd be doing my back end stuff. He'd be doing his front end stuff and it was kind of cute. But then when students started using it, every time we'd get a sale, again, that felt like free money because it doesn't take any more effort on our part to sell a zillion copies or a zillion subscriptions to BMAT Ninja compared to selling one or two subscriptions to BMAT Ninja. And so, that really is the power of digital products. And that was an area in which it was very difficult for other people to compete. And there's a principle of building businesses like this one, which is that you kind of want the cost of entry for someone else to be quite high. Like it's very easy for a random first year medical student to think, hey, let me run a course. It's not that hard, anyone can do it. It's very difficult for a random medical student to think, you know what, let me create a coded question bank completely from scratch. That takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of knowledge, it takes a lot of expertise. And my brother and I taught ourselves this through like years while we were in school. And so we had this unfair advantage of knowing how to code 
while I was a medical student as well. So I knew what medical students wanted. And so by the time I was 23, these different streams of income, I think were making me in the region of 40 to 50,000 pounds a year, which was really, really solid given that I was still a medical student at the time. If you wanna learn more about this streams of income approach, there are three books that I'd recommend. Number one, The 4 Hour Work Week. Number two, The Millionaire Fast Lane. And number three, Take Your Shot by Robin Way. Or if you're looking for something else to watch on YouTube, you might like to check out this video here, which is my top 10 tips for entrepreneurs, the stuff I wished I'd known when I started out on this entrepreneurship journey. And you can click here to check out part two of this video where I talk about my next nine streams of income that I built by the age of 26. So thank you so much for watching. Do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.